we have important but not essential, and then we have not important. There are many debates that go on in the church and among Christians and Christians on social media that really are not important. I've heard long uh, debate and accusation and heated attack on whether you should use real wine or grape juice in communion at church. And there are some on one side that say we should uh, use grape juice and never use wine because if we're using wine, then we're causing problems for ex-alcoholics that have been saved and are in our church and real wine might be the trigger that puts them back into a downward spiral and those who believe they should use real wine because they most likely use real wine and people fight over that for hours on social media and things like that. You have to be intelligent enough and mature enough in your faith to realize there are things that are essential, there are things that are important but not essential, and number three, there are things that are not important. Uh, people debate and argue. What, what style of music should we use in the church? What translation of the Bible should a pastor use if they're really anointed? Well, these are not essential to salvation, and they're not even qualified to be important. But then lastly, pure speculation. And sadly, Christians get in great debate and disagreement and fight and churches have been split over things that are nothing more than pure speculation. Uh, every Christmas, there are immature believers that come out on social media and they attack people over Christmas. What day was Jesus born? Was he born on December 25th? Are there Christmas trees in your house? Are there Christmas trees in your church? You're going to hell if you decorate a Christmas tree. And they go through all of these matters that have nothing to do with the essentials of what the Bible teaches, and they're purely immature believers who have a propensity towards being argumentative and divisive. And the Bible says that believers should not be divided, nor should they cause division in the church. It's not a matter of heaven and hell whether your church has a Christmas tree on the platform or not. But Christians fight over that every Christmas. I've heard Christians on social media arguing, did Adam have a belly button? Really? Get a life. You're going to spend hours on social media going back and forth on speculations as to whether Adam had a belly button or not? And uh, all of these matters fall under what I would call pure speculation. So there in a nutshell is an understanding as to what we debate or what we disagree and certain things that we don't even bother getting into the ring over. And I hope that many of you who follow this ministry will have an upward trajectory in your desire to be an intelligent student of the Bible and to be a mature believer. And I hope that as you learn the Bible with me and as you learn matters pertaining to doctrine in the Scriptures, I hope you'll never with that carry an attitude of arrogance. I hope that as you learn the Bible with me that you'll make a commitment to say, Father, I want to learn the Bible, but I always want to cloak myself in a spirit of humility. We don't want to get knowledge from the Bible and then be condescending to a new believer or even a, a, a sage believer that disagrees with us. Arrogance should never be a part of our attitude in those matters. I like what I heard one scholar say. I, I wrote it down. Let me read it to you. He said in one of his books, I often tell people that there are some things which I believe that I would die for. There are some things which I believe that I would lose an arm for. There are some things which I believe that I would lose a finger for. And then there are many things which I believe I would not even give a manicure for. And so that's kind of a very uh, wise, practical way of, of realizing that within the Bible, there are things that are essential, and on essential doctrines, we stand firm. But when there are disagreements over the complications of certain interpretations, 
whether it's the matter of the gifts of the Spirit or the application of divine healing or the order of end time events or views and positions on eschatology and so on, we don't allow divisiveness and anger and attack to be a part of our attitude if we're going to be Christ-like in dealing with other. Uh, now, listen carefully. If you're taking notes, write this down. Let me teach you the rules for Christ-like engagement. Because if you haven't engaged with a believer who disagrees with you, then you have either been hiding out uh, somewhere at home in a dark closet or you don't get out much. I promise you, if you become a Christian, there are going to be people who disagree with you. You know, one of the things that kind of saddens my heart as an evangelist, as we're seeing hundreds and thousands of people coming to Christ for the very first time through all of our platforms on social media, many times the questions that come my way include, why do Christians disagree? Or I started attending a church, and while I was in a Bible study, why were Christians fighting? I was surprised. I didn't think that Christians would be disrespectful to one another like that. And these are the comments of new believers. And sometimes new believers have a pure, unpolluted heart whereby they understand that Christians should be Christ-like when some of us who have been saved for a long period of time have become calloused to how important it is to be Christ-like with one another. So write this down, rules of Christ-like engagement. Number one, be gracious. Learn how to disagree with another believer without getting your ego involved. Your flesh is supposed to be crucified in Christ. And when you cannot disagree with another believer without getting angry or feel you know, heated or, man, I just want to punch that guy in the nose. Or, you know, if he says that one more time and looks at me, then we're going out back after Bible study and we'll settle this behind the... Number one, be gracious. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. What I'm teaching you today, I have wrestled with personally. You would have to understand my upbringing. Number one, I'm a preacher's kid. Being a preacher's kid, growing up in public school, had its hurdles. Number two, I'm redheaded. Being redheaded makes me a target as a boy growing up in public schools. Number three, I'm left-handed. It singled me out in the classroom in those elementary days from almost everybody else in the class. And, you know, they thought I was a freak because I couldn't hold my pencil in the right hand. And uh, number four, I have a bad temper, or I should say I used to have a bad temper. Because as a child, as a preacher's kid, and let me tell you something, it probably didn't help that my legal name is Tiffany. Tiffany, redheaded, left-handed, preacher's kid. Ask me if I grew up fighting in school. I fought my whole life. And I'm being honest with you because maybe my transparency will help someone I got to a point where I enjoyed fighting. I liked knocking people out. Didn't bother me a bit to see blood run out of somebody's nose. I got a, a bit of enjoyment out of that at a certain time in my life. Seeing somebody laying on the flat of their back with blood running out of their nose and, you know, standing over them and saying, I guess you won't do that again, will you? I guess you'll think twice before you come in my face and do that. Well, and I'll be honest with you. I used to go to church. And I'd go to an altar, and I'd kneel down, and I'd repent, and I'd ask God to forgive me. But most of my childhood and growing up, I had issues with being defensive. Sadly, I knocked two guys out in Bible college in my first semester. And uh, some of you have deleted me from your list of respected preachers. But I feel like I want to share this with people because I've had to learn what I'm trying to teach you. But in Bible college, God delivered me from my temper. And I have never lost my temper 
from an encounter in a chapel service in the presence of God at the age of 18 until today. Now, it doesn't mean that I still don't have the ability to be confrontational, but now my confrontational attitude is wrapped in Christ-like cords, or at least it should be. But I wrestle with this. I have people that, you know, sometimes will come up to me in a service and make crazy accusations. And I feel my old flesh rise up, you know. I might be smiling at them and holding my Bible and being patient and being courteous, but I'm not going to lie. There's times that the old flesh inside just wants to reach out and grab them by their larynx and set them straight. But you can't do that as a believer. Listen to what I'm about to say and don't miss it. Once you become a Christian, you forfeit your right to ever be unkind to anybody. Once you become a Christian, you forfeit your right to ever be unkind to anyone. Now, there are some people that deserve less than kind behavior, but you have to learn to walk away or to remind yourself that I should be crucified in Christ. I am now an ambassador for the Lord Jesus, and my words and my conduct and my attitude should strive to be more like Christ and less like myself. John chapter 3, verse 30. He must increase, I must decrease. So rules of engagement, number one, be gracious. Go out of your way to crucify your feelings and allow a person to speak even if they tick you off even if what they're saying is so far down the chart of intelligence that you're insulted by it, be gracious, because that exists in the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus taught us in John chapter 13 and verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Rule number one of Christ-like engagement in debate and disagreement, be gracious. Number two, be courteous. Now, let me define that in a way that's very practical. One of the most common courtesies that you can extend to a person when communicating is learn how to be a good listener. One of my pet peeves is when people continually cut other people off. And we've all seen that, where somebody's in the middle of a sentence or in the middle of a conversation or in the middle of making a point, and somebody just interrupts them mid-sentence because what they have to say about the matter is more important than the person that's talking. That's not Christ-like. And one of the ways that you can be courteous is even when you disagree with people, let them speak. Let them finish what they have to say. And don't have this look in your eyes as if you're putting up with ignorance. Be gracious. Be courteous. Listen to them. Because if you listen to them, you might find out why they have the point of view they have, and you might do a better job of trying to communicate the truth as it should be. If you disagree with someone... Make sure you express yourself in a way that's not demeaning. Try to disagree with a peaceable spirit. Don't be aggressive and don't be violent and don't be pushy. Be courteous when you disagree with those who disagree with you. Number three, be respectful. Now, you've not heard me say that you're always going to agree. You've heard me say the opposite, but let me put an exclamation point on it. There will always be Christians, even in your own church, even in your own fellowship, even in your own family, that you're going to have strong disagreements with. But you can disagree with them strongly without being mean-spirited about it. And on those occasions, maintaining respect is very important. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 15. Don't think of them as enemies, 
but warn them as you would a brother or sister. Boy, is that just practical, wise, godly advice. Don't treat people that disagree with you like an enemy. Remember, they're your brother and your sister in Christ. Let me go over four things that you must never do when you disagree or debate another Christian. Put that in your notes. Four things you must never do when you disagree or debate with another Christian. Number one, never question the validity of their Christianity. Don't get all heated and say, well, I guess you're not even a Christian. If you were a real Christian, you couldn't have that point of view. Now, there may be people that you'll meet whose views uh, indeed exclude them from being a real Christian. If someone says, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't believe he's God's son, I don't believe he died on a cross, I don't believe he rose from the dead, I don't believe he's coming again, I don't believe he's the only way to have right relationship with God, well, that person has pretty much, by their debate outline, that they're not a Christian. But I'm not going to attack them and say, well, you're going to hell. Never, ever attack the validity of someone's Christianity, because quite frankly, neither I nor you have access to the book of life. There will be people in heaven you thought would never make it. There will be people absent in heaven you thought sure would make it. And the greatest surprise is if you're there yourself. So walk in that humility. Never, ever attack the validity of someone's Christianity. You're not God's defense attorney. Number two, never attack another believer, another believer personally. Don't attack them personally with personal statements and personal... You're talking about a biblical issue. Keep your disagreement or keep your discussion or keep your debate within the circle of the subject without attacking that person personally. Number three, never demean another person. Don't call them stupid. Don't call them a jackass. Don't call them an idiot. And some people are. But don't attack them verbally and insult them and question their intelligence. You just don't do that. Graceful, godly people abstain from that. And then number four, never engage in retaliation. Don't ever figure out, well, I'm going to retaliate. You said that, or you embarrassed me on social media. Where do you see what I do to you? Never, as a godly Christian, retaliate. Let me give you an illustration of, of something very practical that happened to me many years ago, but uh, there was a pastor uh, who had invited me to come to his church, and he wanted me to come for a week of meetings and speak at his church. And I was happy to do so, but when he connected with me, he gave me one set of dates, and uh, when I got back to him, I said, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm already booked on those dates, I cannot come, I'd be happy to come at another time. And, you know, was very gracious with him. He connected with me later, but again, he gave me one set of dates, and uh, it just so happened that my schedule was booked again. You know, uh, years ago, I used to book my schedule one, uh, two, and some events three years in advance. Uh, I did that when I was younger because when I first started out, I had very few invitations to speak. Nobody knew who I was. And so I think, just speaking from a human point of view, I think when I was younger, uh, when I began to get more invitations just out of a, a feeling of security, I tried to make sure that my schedule was full because in those early days, if I wasn't speaking, my children weren't eating. And uh, that is, to this day, our sole means of providing for the ministry and how God uh, provides for this ministry. So it got to the point where I became more well-known that I would book my schedule a year in advance and then two years in advance and certain conferences and camps three years in advance. 
But I soon figured out that it had gotten to the point where my schedule was dictating me instead of me dictating my schedule. And I don't do that anymore. I still have to book uh, quite a long ways in advance. I have more invitations for this current year than I can get in my schedule, but I have not loaded my schedule because I've learned I want to be led by the Lord. I want to be more systematic about where God asks me to go. And so the second time that this man asked me, my calendar was booked again. He got mad at me. I could tell in our communication that he was thinking I didn't want to go to his church. And it wasn't a small church. It was a large church. And uh, I can only speculate, but I, I almost felt like he was insulted that uh, here I am inviting you to come and you're not wanting to come to my church. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know how big our church is? You know, whoever you have on the schedule, you know, you should, you know, cancel them for me. I mean, he didn't say that, but I just got this feeling that he was really upset with me. And then I never heard from him again. And I was as gracious to him in all of my communications as I'm speaking with you now. Then I heard from a pastor. And he was a friend of mine. And he called me. And he said, we were in conversation. He said, Tiff, there's something that's bothering me. Do you mind if I talk to you about something personal? I said, well, of course not. We're dear friends. He said, as your ministry has become larger, he said, I, I'm disappointed. I said, you know, I was perplexed. I said, about what? He said, I heard that you now charge $2,500 a night to make an appearance. And I jokingly said, who told you I'd come for that cheap? And uh, I, I laughed and I said, are, are you serious? Let me tell you something. I'm 63 years old. I've been in ministry for over 43 years. I have never charged one single penny of anybody. You will not find one person in 43 years of traveling the world who can show you a letter from my office that had requirements. I pay for my own plane tickets. I pay for my own hotels. I don't ask for a penny. Now, there are certain churches and certain events that I speak at that uh, have known me for years, and the church has an attitude that, you know, you're not paying for your accommodations when you're here. We'll take care of your accommodations or... You know, where I was just at, uh, the pastor said, uh, give our CFO a copy of your flight. We'll reimburse you for your flight. I said, Pastor, I said, all of the years you've known me, I said, have I ever charged you for a flight? Have I ever charged you for a hotel? Have I charged you for anything? No, but around here, that's how we do it. I said, well, that's between you and your treasurer, but I'm not going to send you a bill. I've never charged anybody anything. Long story short, I found out that the pastor who I wasn't able to connect with on those two dates retaliated against me by spreading rumors all around that the reason I wouldn't come to his church is because I charged X amount of dollars per night. And it was a total lie. Total lie. That's retaliation. And believers and godly people don't retaliate. I never called that pastor, never asked him, never made accusation. I mean, probably a good thing I didn't see him for about six months because I was, uh, <laughs> I was wanting to teach him a lesson. I've already confessed to you that I live in a body of flesh just like, you, like I do. I mean, it irritated me because he was attacking my character and lying. Even a, a large Christian leader called me in my circle of accountability and said, Tiff, when did you start charging X amount of dollars a night? I said, I never did. The pastor in such and such a church started that rumor about me, and I'm just going to let it go. Don't do that. A godly person doesn't retaliate, and let me take it one step further. A godly, humble person doesn't feel a need to defend themselves. God is my defender. God is your defender. Refrain from being a believer who cannot disagree nor debate with another believer without getting personal, without demeaning the believer, without attacking their faith, because you're going to spend your eternity with many of these people. Let me tell you something. Many of the people that you disagree with, you don't know them. And probably if you knew them, 
you might have a different view. I'm not going to do it because I don't name pastors publicly in, in uh, the pulpit or in media, but I have had the privilege of meeting some very notable people in ministry on that stage of what some would call celebrity. And do you know what? Many of these people are viciously attacked by other pastors, by other leaders, by other Christians, by other evangelists, and so on. And they've never met them. They don't know them. And once I've met some of these people and had fellowship with them and got to know them, who they are compared to what everybody said they were like, two different people. And that could be true for you. People can attack you and spread rumors about you and say things about you, and they don't even know you. If they got to know you, they might realize that you're more Christ-like than their accusations. Thank you.